So this is the last talk of the second session of the first day um, by Paolo Bedaki from the University of Maryland, who is going to tell us about um, the sign problem. So um, Paolo, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. By the way, did I turn on the camera? Uh, no. Maybe I should. It's a little weird to speak. Oh, nobody needs to see my face. That's fine. All right, so uh, now something very different. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is, uh, is about how to use some of the ideas that people have discussed in this workshop to solve the very practical problem of doing numerical uh, simulations in quantum field theory. Uh, in particular, the ones that have this sign problem, the famous sign problem. Uh, everybody is familiar with the way that uh, Monte Carlo is used in quantum field theory. Uh, the object of studies expectation values of whatever uh, observer is interested in. And this is written in terms of path integrals as this ratio here. And the fundamental idea of the Monte Carlo method is simply to consider this factor here that I'm trying to draw with my cursor as a probability uh, distribution function. So uh, this ratio of integral, the, the, the expectation value of the observable can be computed by simply finding a bunch of classical configurations. That's what I mean by phi distributed according to the usual Boltzmann factor. And, uh, and then taking the average of whatever observable you, you're interested in on those configurations, right? Now, uh, this is being very successful, uh, but uh, it relies on the fact that the action, at least the Euclidean action, is a positive quantity or and, it, and it, sorry, not only positive, but the real quantity. So the exponential is a positive quantity. So it can be interpreted as a probability distribution. This is true for a lot of cases, but it's not true for all cases. And there are some very famous cases where this fails miserably. And because of that, we have no access to the interesting physics they describe. So famous example is the Hubbard model all the way from half filling. Supposedly this is connected to high TC superconductivity. And when there is doping, so away from half filling, uh, there is a sign problem. And the region that you're particularly interested in, in the superconducting phase, uh, happens at low temperature, so where things are even worse. So this part of the phase diagram is fairly well understood. Everything else is somewhat conjecture. Similar problem happens in QCD when you have a finite baryon density. Uh, so that's what happens inside the nucleus or what happens inside the neutron star. This phase diagram that I put here, uh, temperature versus baryon chemical potential, uh, was chosen because the colors are pretty, uh, because nobody really knows about the different phases and phase transitions that happen there. Uh, perhaps less famous, but in my view, more important than those examples of uh, non-real action, happen when you try to do uh, to compute real-time observables. And what I mean by this is anything that depends on say correlators, uh, where T is real Minkowski uh, time, not imaginary time. And those things are important if you wanna compute transport coefficients, if you wanna do actual non-equilibrium physics. Uh, they appear also in quantities that are related to the light cone, like part on distribution functions, et cetera, et cetera. So in the case of QCD, for example, in the last 10 years, uh, problems where there is no sign problem, uh, observables without the sign problem, uh, have essentially been solved. QCD has been solved in the last decade. Uh, the big uh, uh, hole in our knowledge happens in those particular observables that do have a sign problem. So they are, you know, very important. In fact, my definition of interesting problem uh, is essentially one that has a sign problem. Otherwise, you would just put in a computer and get the answer. Now, the fact that the action is not real doesn't necessarily stop uh, everything on its tracks because there is a standard trick to be done. So we split the real and imaginary part and uh, multiply the divide the ratio by some quantity. And this quantity is just the Boltzmann factor with the real part of the action. Okay. Now, each one of those ratios here can be computed by standard Monte Carlo methods because there is a perfectly real action. And what you get is a ratio of two observables. One is the original observable multiplied by the phase given by the imaginary part of the action. And the other is just the phase itself. So this quantity the denominator is gonna appear frequently in this talk, it's called the average phase. The catch with this is that uh, 
very quickly, meaning for large volumes and for low temperatures, uh, both numbers top and down are very small. They're actually exponentially small on volume and uh, inverse temperature. So you have a ratio of two very small numbers, a little bit of a, of a stochastic error and makes the computation of this ratio completely impossible. So it's a, it's a computational problem that's actually exponentially hard. Another intuitive way of understanding this is just the fact that if the action is not real, there is a phase on the integrand. So you're trying to compute the integrand sort of like this, for example, I give a very simple example here. To compute this value precisely, that happens to be square root of pi, I need to compute this integral very carefully and get the cancellations between the positive and the negative spikes here. In one part, in this case, one part in 10 to 170. Otherwise, uh, the fine subtle cancellation disappears and I don't get the right answer. And of course, this is completely impossible for any computer that you ever be built ever. Now, this example is chosen because it kind of offers an obvious trivial answer uh, immediately, right? Uh, the right thing to do here would be not to try to do a numerical calculation on the real axis where those oscillations are gonna kill you, but use the Cauchy theorem and move the contour of integration to some other line, say for example, this one. And the value of the integral is the same, but the integrand here is very well behaved and the problem is trivially solved. So that simple idea is actually what's behind everything that we are gonna do uh, here. So of course in field theory, we have an infinite dimensional integral and even having a finite volume and putting a lattice regulator uh, we still have a lot of dimensions. So if, you, if, your, if your field lives on, say you have n real fields, so they live on Rn, uh, the idea then is gonna be to complexify the space and deform the domain of integration from Rn to some other manifold and use some form of Cauchy theorem to relate the value of the integral here to the volume of the integral of this other manifold. That's the, that's the idea. Now, uh, this thing that I call Cauchy-Stokes theorem uh, guarantees the quality of the two, two integrals. Uh, the conditions for this is that first, the integrand is holomorphic. So in all ex examples of any interesting field theory, the integrand is holomorphic. So don't have to worry about this first item. We do have to worry a little bit about the second one. So just like in one dimensional integrals, of course, as you change the contour, you might cross a pole at infinity and, and that's a problem. And of course, then you, you, the value of the integral jumps to a completely different value. Or in other words, uh, different manifolds that you take are gonna lie on different homology classes. And you want to make sure you are in the right one to get the right answer. Now, there are, there are several methods now of how to, how to find a suitable manifold that where the sign problem would be better and but you'd still give the same value of the integral. 99% uh, of the work uh, is based on the idea of the holomorphic flow. So as you are probably familiar with, uh, the holomorphic flow is given by this equation here. So phi is gonna stand for the different fields I have in my, in my theory. And uh, I indexes the points in space time and whether uh, you know, internal indices you might have. And the bar for me is the complex conjugation. So as you know, uh, this holomorphic flow here has two interesting properties. One is that if you follow the flow, the value of the real, action, uh, real part of the action uh, grows monotonically. The other property is that the imaginary part of the action stays constant if you move along, along the flow. Now, uh, I'm belaboring some points here because they're gonna be important and they're gonna kind of suggest an algorithm in a, in a second. Uh, but now I want to point out the following fact. So the fact that the, if I start from the real plane, meaning take the initial conditions of my flow to be different points in the real, the real plane and evolve according to the flow, the real part of the action grows. So e to the minus sr decreases. So if the integral is well-defined on Rn, it's gonna be even more defined in this other manifold. And this is true for every, if I do this, this change of manifold in a continuous way, it's gonna be true at every intermediate step. 
And that guarantees that the integral exists, it's convergent at every uh, point of the deformation. Now to change to a different homology class, I would have to have a divergent integral and then you jump to a different homology class in a discontinuous way. Uh, if the integral is well defined at all times, then this cannot happen. So this sort of guarantees that my, uh, uh, the evolution taking the real plane and evolving according to holomorphic flow uh, gives you a different manifold that's in the same homology classes initially. What's not so obvious is that if I, have, if I take the, the, uh, the real plane and evolve according to holomorphic flow, I get a different manifold where the same problem is any better. In fact, I just told you that the imaginary part doesn't change at all. So why should the design problem be any better if I do that? And the way to understand this is to uh, understand a little bit about the geometry of the holomorphic flow. So in complex fight space, there's gonna be several points, uh, critical points where the gradient of the action is zero. There are a lot of them. There's one for every solution of the equations of motion in complex space, so they are dime a dozen. So I denote this by those points. Around the critical points, because of Cauchy-Riemann, uh, there's gonna be in real directions where the real part of the action grows. And there's gonna be other end directions where it decreases. So the flow goes away this direction and go toward the critical point in these other directions. Now, if you go along the directions where the action grows, you're gonna get that n dimension manifold that's the table. And there's gonna be one for every critical point. Now, if your action is a, is, if you have a bosonic theory, the action is gonna be typically a polynomial on the field. And the, the only points where the action can diverge, can be infinite, are at infinity. However, if you have a, a fermionic theory and you formally integrate the fermions uh, before you do anything, your effective action includes a thermal determinant. So in the lattice, the action is gonna have a term that's a log of a polynomial. Now log of a polynomial is gonna have uh, di uh, divergent singularities at a finite distance. And that's what I try to, to depict here in the, uh, the junction of the two thimbles. So going from the critical point along the thimble, the real part of the action grows. And right here, it reaches infinity. There is a log singularity. Okay. Also, as the imaginary part of the action does not change as you follow the flow. The imaginary part of the action along the thimble is fixed. And of course, that's the reason why thimbles have any relevance to the, to the sign problem. If I were to do the integral over a thimble, there wouldn't be any sign problem at all. So that's the idea that I want to explore further. Now, imagine that I start from, from some point in the, the real plane and I evolve this point according to the holomorphic flow. Now for some very special points, it's gonna evolve and it's gonna hit the critical point. In other words, uh, if I call the thimble, the directions where the uh, real part of the action grows and the duo or anti-thimble, whatever, whatever we're gonna call it, the opposite, the, the directions where they decrease, uh, the anti-thimble, the dual thimble, is gonna be some n-dimensional manifold that generically is gonna intersect the real plane since they live in two n-dimensions at a point. So under very mild assumptions, the dual thimble is gonna cross the real plane at some isolated points. Now what happens to points that are very close to, the, to this pre-image of the critical point? Well, initially they move very close, closely to the critical point, but eventually they veer off and they kind of hug approach to the thimble. Points that are not close to this pre-image of the critical point, they just quickly flow towards where the action is large, in particular where the diverge is here at the junction of the, at the border of the two thimbles. Now, uh, that means that the points that are very close to the to this pre-image of the critical points are gonna have a small uh, real part of the action. And by action, I mean not the action computed here, but the action computed there. These other points that are kind of in the middle, they're gonna have a very large action because as they evolve, they actually can hit the singularity at a finite time. So it's actually, you know, divergent uh, real part of the action. Now, if I take every single point of the real plane and evolve by a large but finite amount of time, 
I'm going to then find a manifold that's going to approach uh, the thimbles. Not going to be quite the same. They're going to be close to the thimbles. Now, thimble, there are many, many thimbles. Uh, and the integral of the real plane is equivalent to the integral of a certain combination of thimbles. Typically, it's very difficult to find this combination of thimbles. Only in toy models you can find what they are. They're not going to find this in QCD. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that there is a characterization of what those, those uh, thimbles are. They are basically the ones where if I start from the real plane uh, and I evolve, sorry, let me, let me do the other way around. If I were to start from the thimble and move backwards according to the flow, they would hit the real plane. So what I'm saying here is just the usual thimble decomposition of an integral, right? Uh, the integral over, say, Rn uh, is equal to an uh, integral over a bunch of different thimbles and weighted by a certain integer that basically counts the number of times the dual thimble intersects the real plane. Most of the time, this n is just zero, so the thimble doesn't contribute at all. Now, what does that have to do with the actual algorithmics of computing the integral? Well, the idea is this. So first, let me understand why using this red manifold that approaches the thimbles, but is not quite the thimble. Uh, why would they have a better sign problem? So one way of understanding is that they are close to thimbles. The thimbles have a constant phase, constant imaginary part of the action. So the sign sh should be fixed. So there should be any sign problem. Another way of thinking is this. Uh, if I do a Monte Carlo, if I look at the path integral, and I weight my points, not by the value of the action here, but the value of the action after I flow. Points that are near the pre-image of the critical point are going to have a small real part of the action, as we discussed before. So they're going to be sampled a lot. If I do a Monte Carlo process, uh, I'm going to sample a lot of those points, and here too. I'm not going to sample points in the middle, because the corresponding effective action, that's the action after I flow, is going to be enormous. So they have a very little probability. Now, points that are very close here on the real plane have a very close imaginary part of the action. So they have a very similar phase. But the phase does not change as they evolve according to the flow. So consequently, the points here on the red manifold are going to have a very similar phase. But it's just another way of saying that they're very close to the thimble. So this suggests an obvious uh, uh, algorithm to actually compute the integral, not only over thimbles, but over the right combination of thimbles that corresponds to the integral started out with. And it's an algorithm that works even if I don't know where the thimbles are or what the intersection numbers are or any of this. All this is computed on the fly by the algorithm. So the idea is that you take my observable, and I don't compute the integral over the real plane. I, I, I use some other manifold that I obtain by flowing the real plane. Uh, that manifold can be parameterized by the real plane itself because it can connect a point on the real plane to a point on this red manifold by the flow. By the way, let me show you here. By, you know, there's a correspondence between a point on the red man manifold to a point on the real plane. Now, when I do this, of course, there is a Jacobian. And a lot of thinking goes into computing the Jacobian, but let's put it aside for a while. So I have a real, I, I need to groove with the real plane again, except it has a modified action. It's the action calculated not on the real plane, but after the flow. And there's a Jacobian that goes with it. Now I split into real imaginary part, do the usual trick of real weighting, and I'm left with this. Now, I still have real weighting, and I still have an average phase that I have to worry. The average phase here, though, is very different from the original one that I had when I integrated over Rn. It, what appears here, for example, is the imaginary part of the action, not on the real plane, but on this other manifold where the, the imaginary part of the action is almost constant anyway. So that's how you make your money. That's how you improve the sign and how you solve the sign problem. The price you have to pay is that uh, you have to solve numerically the flow equations. And not only this, I also need the value of this determinant. And the determinant is extremely expensive. Uh, can be computed by evolving this matrix here. So if I have n points in my, my lattice, 
And remember, this goes with the volume of the space time. So it's, it grows very fast. Uh, this is an n by n matrix. I have to evolve and calculate all this. And at the end of the day, I have to compute the determinant. That's an n cube process. So if I have a lattice that size L and I'm four dimensions, n is L to the fourth. When I cube that, I have L to the 12th power. That means I cannot compute anything. So all kinds of tricks are used to actually deal with the determinant in a practical way. But the basic idea is what I said here. You use any algorithm like Metropolis or more sophisticated algorithms uh, in real space, except that you don't use the normal action, use the action after you uh, flow according to the holomorphic flow. Hopefully, if I did a good job here, uh, you're going to find that all this is kind of obvious and natural and you know, reasonable. But I have to point out that when the first idea came out, the idea was to integrate over thimbles. And there was very little hope that one could ever integrate over more than one thimble. Because they were disconnected and people didn't know how to find them. And there was some hope that maybe one thimble was good enough. And anyway, there's a whole literature on that, that I think was completely bypassed if you just take this other point of view. Since I'm giving a practical talk about practical matters, I'm going to give some examples and show data with error bars and all that. So uh, consider one simple example that we did was the massive theory model. It's a, it's a, one of those classical models. Uh, we can use a lattice, uh, we can use different Fermion formulations. doesn't really matter the details here, but I can tell you that you can do a simulation very easily. That, that's in your laptop. Uh, that's very close to the continuum limit in this strong couple, coupled regime uh, and this close to the thermodynamic limit too. So it's kind of a real Monte Carlo field theory calculation. And it's very instructive the way it works. So the way it works is this. Uh, first to try to go by brute force. So you do nothing, you integrate over the real uh, variables. And you compute your things. You compute, say, the density, because this is at finite chemical potential. So there's going to be a finite number of fermions in our lattice uh, as a function of the chemical potential, mu. And I'm also going to compute the denominator that I said was problematic, the average sign. When this quantity approaches zero, uh, my arrows explode. And that's exactly what you see. As soon as the chemical potential is comparable to the fermion mass, meaning as long as there is a single fermion in your lattice, the phase approaches zero and your result just has enormous error bars. Don't be fooled by these little error bars here. When the error bar is enormous, it's difficult to estimate the errors. So this error bar here is more realistic. Now I do something slightly better than that. I just shift by hand the integration from the real plane to the tangent plane of one of the thimbles. I can do this because I know what it is, this particular one, so it's an easy thing to do. So just go ahead and do it. And what I see this, the sign improves. It's much larger. And it's not until I get mu of the order of three times the final mass that I start having a real sign problem. And that's the answer that I get in red. And as soon as I hit three final masses, my arrows explode again. It's very sudden. But then you do something better. Then you do the procedure that I just told you. Uh, you flow and you try to find some other manifold that's not flat, that's curved, has a shape that's difficult to visualize. Uh, here we are working on a space that has 200 dimensions already. So it's not easy to visualize this. Uh, but the computer doesn't care and you can do that. And what you find out is that this sign gets very civilized, very close to one with a little flow. Consequently, you get your observable uh, very well with tiny little error bars. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of technical details here I'm not getting to. This is not a computational crowd, so I'm not going to get into that. I'll be glad to talk to you. But it does require some a little bit of cleverness, imagination to, to make this work. But the basic idea is this, okay? It's just flowing with the holomorphic flow, getting a different manifold and doing the integration there. And a problem that was essentially impossible becomes somewhat trivial. You can go ahead and do other things. For example, you can compute the density as a function of the chemical potential. 
uh, at colder and colder temperatures, meaning going to these blue curves. And you have these plateaus. These plateaus appear when another pair of fermions pops up in the system. And for example, it's known from, from Yuga's work actually in a simple model that if you don't do the calculation right to integrate over a single thimble instead of all the thimbles, uh, this uh, correct uh, step structure here disappears and it gets totally washed out. So it's nice to see actually things working as they, as they should. I'm gonna change here because I wanna check my time a little bit. Uh, let me try again, okay. Now, uh, I mentioned before that real-time problems were the ones that are, have a really bad sign problem and for which there is essentially no numerical method to, to apply. Now, at least there is a well-known path integral formulation for quantities of this kind, thermal expectation values of real time. This is real Minkowski time. And it's known as the schinger kaldish contour. So this part here of the uh, density matrix is computed by doing an imaginary part integral the usual way, but then you evolve in real time. But since you need a trace, you have to come back. So you come back here and you you put in post periodic boundary conditions. So the schindler kaldish formalism is well known and uh, people do perturbative calculations with it. And it's a well-known thing. The use of it in Monte Carlo is essentially known starter. And the reason for this is kind of obvious. Consider a, a field that uh, evaluated at this particular time, any, any real time. Well, as I vary that field, the action that now is not a Boltzmann factor, but has an imaginary part, right? It's e to the i, the action. Uh, well, it's a, it's a, it, doesn't, it doesn't get damped out like it does in, in Minkowski space, sorry, in, in Euclidean space. So the integral of a, over a single field, the value of the field at a single point in time, uh, actually averages to, average to zero. So not only the sign problem is bad, like exponentially small, it's strictly zero. So I call this the mother of all sign problems because if I improve this by a billion, it's still an impossible problem to solve. So let's try. And uh, again, I'm not gonna get into details here. Uh, there are algorithmic uh, complications in making this work. If you wanna do it in an interesting way in your laptop, but it can be done. And let me just flesh out some results here. This is for a one plus one dimensional 5-4 theory. It's simple, simplest field theory you can imagine. Uh, it's a small lattice, but it's not ridiculously small. And let me start at small coupling. So at so small coupling, I can use perturbation theory, calculate things and check whether my Monte Carlo is doing the right thing. So what I have here is a correlator. It's like the propagator of the theory, project a different momenta, p equal to zero and p equal to one. And as a function of real time, and I have in blue and red the imaginary, the real and the imaginary parts. So this is just sinus and cosines. Now I can compute in perturbation theory what the first correction would be, and it's a little different, and that's what it is. Then I can run the Monte Carlo, run this whole thing, start from the real plane, evolve according to holomorphic flow. I have no idea of the shape of what this manifold is because it lives in, in this case, just a hundred dimensions, but it's already too much for me to visualize. It picks up contributions for a number of thimbles. I don't know where they are and I don't really care. The algorithm takes care uh, of all those little details for me, but that's the result that I get. So recoupling, I, I nail the perturbative results. So I have a feeling that I'm not fooling myself. When you do an interesting case where the coupling is actually not perturbative, what you see is that perturbation theory gives me a very different answer from the free theory. And the Monte Carlo result gives yet another one. Of course, there's no way to check this, but I'm pretty sure uh, we are getting it correct. Now, there are limitations to this. Uh, it's probably time to revisit this problem with new technology that we developed last year or two. But uh, we found all kinds of problems as soon as the time is very long. So for example, to compute transport coefficients, in principle, I need a very long time. It's in principle, an infinite amount of time, but in practice, a large amount of time. This is not quite enough. And that's why I'm not 
for the first time ever, computing transport coefficients of strongly coupled theories from first principles. Uh, there is a sharp increase in cost with T, but again, we have better algorithms now, so maybe that change. There's also a, a simple observation one should make uh, to keep your feet on, on the ground. Suppose I did have a method to compute real-time evolution of quantum systems, and uh, that there was no exponential cost to it. Well, then what I should do is not to simulate 5-4 theory, but what I should simulate is, is a quantum computer. It's a quantum system, so I should be able to calculate its time evolution on a classical computer, say my laptop. And if there is no exponential cost in doing this, I should be able to simulate the Shor algorithm on a classical computer. And the cost would be the Shor algorithm cost, so that's log square of n. And of course, that's not likely to be true. In fact, it's almost guaranteed not to be true because factorizing numbers in you know log square you know, nobody believes that's true. So probably what happens is that after all, all we do is to, if it works, is that we still have an exponentially hard problem from the point of view of a, of a computer scientist, it's still exponentially hard, is that the exponent, exponent may be very different. And there are indi indications that it is very different. So anyway, we still, we still make a profit. I'm not saying this is not gonna work, but you know, there are limitations to it. Now, I've been talking about using this other manifold that we obtain from the real plane by uh, using the holomorphic flow, but really there's nothing special about the holomorphic flow. People who do semi-classics, like everybody in this workshop, uh, think in those terms because symbols are special for your point of view. I think from my point of view, they are not that special. By that I mean, uh, after complexifying, uh, I have a, a space with two n dimensions. The fact that the imaginary part of the action is a constant is just one constraint. And if I want a manifold that has n dimensions, there is a lot of room to maneuver an n dimensional manifold respecting only one constraint when I'm living in two n dimensions. The thimble is just one possible manifold that satisfies this characteristics, but there must be many, many more. Of course, in, when n is equal to one, the, you know, the complex analysis cases that we learn in school, uh, there is no wrong. The steepest descent path is unique, but in more dimensions, I don't think it is. I mean, it is in the sense of doing semi-classics, but in the sense of keeping the imaginary part of the constant, uh, of the action constant, in other words, to solve the same problem, I, I, I really don't see anything very special about symbols. So if that's the case, we should be able to come up with different algorithms that find other manifolds that might be better. Maybe they don't control the same problem so much, but so well, but they are just algorithmically easier. So there is one idea out there that was already implemented and tested. So for that, consider uh, the average phase. So that's the quantity I want to be as close to one as possible. I don't want this to approach to zero. Now this is given by, by this, expectation value of the imaginary part of the action according to the real action measure. Now the denominator, top part of this fraction here is an integral of a holomorphic function. So if I change my manifold continuously under certain conditions, the denominator will never change. But the denominator is not holomorphic because I'm, I'm taking the real part of the action. So that changes and that's why the sign may change from one manifold to another. So I can impose the, the, the fact that I want to maximize what the average sign is. To maximize the sign, I want to compute the gradient of it. And it turns out that the gradient can be numerically computed by an integral that has no sign problem, where only the real part of the action appears. So the idea is that one could do a short kind of uh, rough Monte Carlo calculation, a little noise won't bother me so much, uh, in a space where, so I take, a, I take a family of manifolds, parameterized say by 10 parameters. And in this space of 10 parameters, I can compute the gradient. That's what those lambdas means, the, the different parameters of my family of manifolds. In that space, I can compute the gradient. I can follow the gradient and find uh, in that family of manifolds, the one that has the largest sign. Uh, hopefully that's gonna be a good, good manifold to do my integration. If I make the family of manifolds larger and larger, have more and more parameters, or if I'm very good at 
having cited the theory and I have a good ansatz, I should be able to find a manifold unrelated to symbols, but that solves the sign problem too. So this was actually worked out in that very same theory that I mentioned before, the theory model, but actually in two plus one dimensions. So we took the ansatz to be a manifold. I drew here as, as symbols, but I shouldn't have, should be some other shape of manifold, okay? And I parameterized this manifold as the real part of phi being just the real part of a point here. Uh, and I have a family given by say three parameters, lambda zero, one, and two. Very simple form. Now, this is a very restrictive ansatz because the value of the field, the complex field at one uh, lattice site depends on the real part of that field on that same site. And the reason I take this is because the determinant becomes the Jacobian, becomes trivial. And the Jacobian is a big cost for me. But I do that because that's what I can do. And uh, something very funny happens. It's very interesting. So as you, as you follow the, the gradient, so we call this training. So in the language of uh, machine learning, this is what's called unsupervised training. Uh, we have a method to adjust parameters such a way to satisfy a goal, namely to maximize the average phase. And it's unsupervised because I don't give examples for the method to train itself. I just give a goal. So uh, during this, let me call training, uh, what you find is that in the first 10 seconds, the value of lambda zero becomes the ideal value. And it's something that we knew before doing this. By experience and just by looking at equations, we can tell that shifting the field by a fixed imaginary part improves the sign problem tremendously. It basically puts you at the tangent value of one of the thimbles. So it's a rough approximation to the thimble, so it's already good. But you have a little more general, so it takes a little while to pick up the best values of lambda one and lambda two. And here are examples. Uh, so in the two plus one theory model, uh, I have here the Carl condensate as a function of the chemical potential in a small lattice, and then at a, a smaller temperature, and I get smaller temperature. So you see that there is a first order phase transition developing of Carl symmetry restoration. Okay. With that, we can actually uh, get a, a rough estimate of the phase diagram of the theory in a quantitative way. And it's pretty much what everybody expected. There is a cold and low density phase where chiral symmetry is broken and a high temperature, high density phase where the uh, chiral symmetry is roughly restored. Not completely restored because the fermion masses are not zero in this case. Now, the big flaw in this work here and you know, similar ones, is that this is this is very, very simple. Simplistic, I would say. In particular, the condition that the field, the complex field at one site depends on the fields on this very same site. There's no physical, there's a very slim physical motivation for this. Uh, that's true only in the limit of infinite chemical potential. Uh, but you know, if we had a little more insight into the correct shape of the thimbles or insight in general about the you know, complexified theory, I'm probably going to be able to find better ansatze. And if I have better ansatze, I'm going to have better results. Now, the correctness of the results is guaranteed because this is a Monte Carlo and every step of the way we have equal signs. So within the stochastic error, this is an exact method. Uh, but efficiency depends on the ingenuity of the ansatze. So, you know, there is room here for, for physical insight, and that's essentially what we need more of. Gotcha, I don't know how I'm going in the time. Okay, that's about right. So, let me just summarize here with the, with the take home lessons. The basic one is, is that change the integration from the real plane to some other manifolds. It's good. It's good in the sense that it's a whole new. Uh, playground for people who have studied same problem forever uh, and run out of ideas. In some cases, it's going to make it better. In some cases, it's going to make it worse. But it's a new game, so we should be able to play it and see if we can win it in interesting cases like QCD. The thing that I very few people I think uh, appreciate properly is that thimbles, uh, as interesting as they are, seem to be just one possibility among many. Now, I don't have any 
construction or any method to generate other manifolds that are, have the same property of having constant states, except following the holomorphic flow and getting symbols. But, you know, doesn't mean that such a method does not exist. There's a lot of, you know, the beauty is on the details and there is a lot of algorithmic work done in improving the, the calculation of the Jacobian and the, the, there's, there's a big literature here, okay? Uh, and finally, especially for the, for the crowd in this workshop, uh, I'd like to emphasize the idea that we have very little insight into the to field theories in complex space. And any insight that we have, especially in gauge theories, where everything is a little more complicated, uh, would have a practical application, that is to have better unzapped it for, for this kind of calculation. And this may be the difference between actually you know, solving QCD of finite, finite density or not. So uh, at least from the corner of physics I'm from, this is a holy grail and this has enormous weight. So anybody with mathematical, uh, 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 a mathematical bent that's interested in this kind of problems should spend five minutes in maybe using our talents to help me here because you know, it'll be very appreciated. Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much, Paolo, for a great talk. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. Anyone who has a question, please raise your hand. Ah, Sergey. Yeah, thank you for a very nice talk. I was uh, very intrigued by two comments which appeared in separate parts of the talk. One is that maybe left symbols should be replaced by other sub-manifolds and um, uh, the part about machine learning. So I was wondering, could machine learning possibly help uh, to find this uh, other alternatives which are alternatives to left symbols? Yeah, so I, I, I set up this question, right? So I should answer. So there are at least two ways where this, the answer is probably true. Uh, one is right here on this transparency. Can you guys still see the transparency? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here I have a very simple one that's, that's just the first few terms of a Fourier series. There is no reason for this form to be correct. In particular, I can make ansatz that are much more complicated that mix different points in space-time in space uh, by just creating a neural net that connects the real part of the field to the complex part. They can be very general. In fact, there are theorems that prove that if I make the neural net be large enough, I can represent any function. Uh, the question is training, but training neural nets to satisfy certain criteria, like, for example, fixing the the, 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 the average sign is something for which there is an enormous literature. So that's one thing I'm doing like right now, but I have no results to show. And, uh, but anyway, so that's one way machine learning definitely helps. There's another one uh, that's kind of an intermediate thing. I even have the transparencies here. That's the following. Uh, suppose I follow the usual method following the holomorphic flow and I collect a bunch of configurations in this modified manifold. Those are the blue dots here. I collect a few, a hundred, maybe 200. Then I can use a regular machine learning uh, uh, techniques to interpolate this, this point, because that's what learning is, is interpolating known cases, right? In, so we found a particular neural net, for example, that does the job, and using very standard machine learning techniques, we actually found you know, an alternative, so let me, let me draw here, uh, a manifold that has the good asymptotic behavior and it interpolates between known points. The advantage of this is that it's very easy to find more points uh, on this manifold uh, using the neural net. So I compute 100 points in the hard way, evolving, calculating, solving the holomorphic flow, and then I generate 10 more million points really cheaply. And whatever sign of problem was left because this manifold is not that good, I can beat up with statistics. So that was try and that was relatively successful too. I'm more excited about this. So this would be called supervised learning because I give them a few points and I tell the neural nets to learn those points and produce some more. Uh, this other idea here, 
and I lost transparency. Anyway, this other idea would be more of an unsupervised learning in the sense that I only give a goal to the neural net, namely to maximize the sign and get the results. Okay. Having said that, I insist on that point. Uh, whatever neural net I invent to represent the imaginary part of my fields, instead of the simple form here, uh, it's not gonna represent all possible manifolds. So if I had any insight about where the good ones are, if there was some kind of construction, there would be an enormous help. So there you go. Thank you. Very interesting. More, more questions? Okay, Yuya. Uh, yeah, thank you for a nice talk. So you mentioned a little bit about the gauge theory. So, so, so in the case of, yeah, if system has gauge invariance, so do we have a nice way to put an under satisfying gauge invariance for applying this kind of holomorphic method? or uh, machine learning method. Yeah, so uh, I may not be answering the question that you asked, so I apologize for that, but let me tell you the little I know about gauge theories. So the first thing we, we, one could worry about is that uh, there's frequently no well-defined thing about decomposition. And I would argue that this is not a problem, at least not a conceptual problem. Uh, if you notice the way I, de I developed this, this talk in, right in the beginning, I went to very standard material in a way that was suitable to me. And the point I was trying to make was this, take the real plane, evolve according to the holomorphic flow by any amount of time. You get a manifold that is correct, the same homology class, and where the sign is gonna be better, period. I never use the word thimble or thimble decomposition. In fact, we tested this idea on the Schinger model. We made up a model where it has three times, three kinds of formulas is charged like one, one and minus two. So there is a sign problem, finite density. And, uh, and we applied this methodology, at least the methodology as of three years ago. Uh, it didn't go very well in terms of numerics, it was not very efficient, so we kind of put it on the side. But conceptually, we got the right answer. Uh, even in cases where there was a you know, big Stokes phenomenon right in front of us, that was not a problem for, for what we're constructing. So I'm not too worried about that. Now your question was a little more specific, right? It was about constructing ansatz that had respect to gauge invariance and so on and so forth. Uh, we tried many different things. I don't think there is anything fundamentally wrong with any of them, but let me point it out. So for example, instead of inputting here the real part of the fields, I could input the real part of the plaquettes. And at least in QED, that contains all the information that I need. So that would be a trivial way of imposing gauge invariance. For non-abelian theories, it requires a little more thinking and haven't made up my mind about what would be the efficient thing to do. And the reason for this is because I think there is a bigger problem that confuses me. And the problem is this. Uh, didn't give any details about the Turing model, but the equivalent bosonic field there can be thought of as a compact variable. So it lives, lives in S1. So in S1, there is really no asymptotics. As long as you make your field to be periodic in field space, uh, and you evolve it in a continuous way, uh, you never leave the homology class by construction. For a gauge theory, say SU2 or SU3, uh, I still have a compact space, so we don't have to worry about the asymptotics, but I do have to guarantee that my fields are periodic. Uh, well, or to be more precise, not the fields, but you know, this parameterization here. And that's not an easy thing to do in practice. So that's what I think what the, the, the main problem is. I don't think it's unsolvable, but it requires some thinking and I haven't done that thinking. But you know, for, for a practical implementation, this is, this is necessary. So anyway, I don't know if I answer your question, Yuya. Yeah, yeah, but uh, I got the point. So, 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 we, so inside a complexified gauge group, we should find some good 
periodic manifold, which is a and putting some nice answers within that kind of thing, maybe we can use this technique directly to the gay theory. Is that yeah, right? like in this case, for example, the, the, the thing is very trivial. The, 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 the real mm. field is in S1, it's a circle. Yeah, yeah. Complex, you get a cylinder. Mm -hmm. If you start from a cylinder and you evolve it continuously, so at every uh, point in space time, you have a circle moving the cylinder, uh, you cannot change the homology class, right? Well, the I thing see. that could happen in SU3 is just in practice, I have to actually have a specific parameterization with mm. boundaries and I have to understand how that works. And it's a little hairy. And anyway, haven't haven't done that. You know. I see, Not, yeah, thank, thank you so much. Okay, Gerald has a question. Hi, Paolo. Um, at this point, is the calculation of the Jacobian a big deal numerically? Is, is this an obstacle? It's a huge obstacle. In fact, we never so, compute. We find ways not to compute. It. Okay. And there is a long list of ways to, to not to compute it. Uh, otherwise, you're restricted to do you know, a two by two lattice or something like this. Okay. okay. So can you remind me what are the ways around yeah, that? Anyway, so uh, before I do this, uh, let me point it out. So I, I didn't put any references in this talk, mm. uh, but I'm looking at one because I feel very strongly about it. Here we go. It's a review on all this. with yes. all that to do with the project that just came out. And uh, so you should you know, take a notice on that. So let me point it out a few methods here. I, I didn't talk about them in the talk, uh, but let me, let me go here, for example. Sorry for that. Here we go. So I made a big stink of the fact that my ansatz was extremely simple. My, my, my imaginary part of my field depended on the real part of the field at that very same space-time form. So it was a, uh, it was a, a very diagonal you know, uh, transformation. Uh, the point of this is that the Jacobian is trivial for that kind of thing. Right? So it's entirely for computational reasons. There is no much physics behind this at all. So that's a way of avoiding computing the Jacobian. Uh, there is another way that I did not talk about and without being able to write equations would be a little complicated, but I think I can. So let me, let me just go to the right transparency here, just to give a flavor of what's involved here. So these are the equations that would be necessary to solve to actually find the Jacobian. Mm -hmm. So what, what it, it, it's more or less self-explanatory, right? You're transporting a second derivative along the mm -hmm. uh, Suppose this bar was not here. There was no complex conjugate. Well, then you know how to solve this equation by hand. Is this the, the matrix exponential, right? And a matrix exponential is much simpler to solve than this. And then the question becomes, well, if I just drop the complex conjugate, would I be making a big error or a small error? Well, it depends on the case. In a lot of cases, it's a small error. So what you do is, during the Monte Carlo, you, pre you use the wrong Jacobian. You use the Jacobian that you get by just matrix exponentiation. Very cheap. Mm -hmm. okay. At the end of the day, though, you want to get the right results, right? You're serious people. So we reweight the same way that we reweighted the full Jacobian, you can rate the difference between these two Jacobians and you still get the, the correct result. Now this introduces a little bit of a sign problem that may or may not be bad. So that's another way of, uh, of dealing with the Jacobian. There are even clever things to do, like in real time, this does not work. And to make our real time uh, calculation to work, we had to use, and I have a picture somehow where, here we go, okay. Um, I don't think I'm gonna even try to explain how this works. It's a little involved. I mean, it's not nothing deep, but you know, it, it requires some equations, okay? Uh, if you know anything about what the Grady algorithm is, it's some piece of uh, lattice QCD lost in history in the 80s. But anyway, we explore that kind of idea. Basically, you make a proposal, a uh, Monte Carlo proposal that's biased. And it's biased in a way that incorporates the effect of the Jacobian. 
And, but you know, we have to buy us in a very clever way. And sorry, Gerald, I should be able to, yeah. to yeah, no, no, this... uh, intuition here, but it's actually, I don't have to, I don't know. How okay. To. All right. Well, I, I realize it's not an easy problem to work. Right. Uh, any more questions? Okay. Um, if not, let's uh, thank both uh, Paolo and uh, Sergey for um, the great talks and thank you. Um, and the session. So thank you so much for the talks.